On Tech News Today, everybody complains about online privacy violation. Now the EFF wants you to do something about it. Plus, artificial intelligence algorithms are being used to defeat ISIS. And remember Microsoft's Clippy? Well, he's back. And this time, he's gotten into the music business. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, August 7th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin, and our co-anchor today is Mashable senior tech correspondent, Christina One Direction Warren. How are you doing, Christina? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good, One Direction Warren. I like that. Yeah, so you went, uh, I saw some pictures that you posted <laughs> that was uh, quite... Uh, Surprising even for you, but... Uh, uh, it was. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Look, I never thought that in my early 30s I would be at a boy band concert, let alone a One Direction concert, but there was a group on, <laughs> and I was excited. Perfect. Uh, unbelievable. Well, speaking of uh, entertainment and popular culture, the debates <laughs> yes. last night were surprisingly entertaining. Uh, the uh, GOP debates and uh, fo the Fox News um, interrogators or interviewers or moderators, whatever you want to call them, were actually really great. They, they actually asked some really good questions, pretty, some pretty hard-hitting questions. They held some of the, uh, the debaters to task. Unfortunately, lots of people didn't see it because their stream was hosed. Um, and you have uh, some insight as to why that happened. Yeah, so it's funny. You know, um, Fox has the, had the first, you know, GOP debate and... Donald Trump was obviously the big draw there. It was it, it was big news. But if you wanted to watch it on foxnews.com or on their mobile app, um, you were not able to. The stream is down for almost the entire debate. Um, but, uh, Sky TV or Sky News, which is owned by the same company as Fox News, they did have it on YouTube for most of the debate. Then Fox issued a takedown notice and made them take down their YouTube stream, which was very funny. Exactly that, that image right there. Uh, just have another Murdoch company um, making an, one Murdoch company take another Murdoch company's uh, stream down was ironic. <laughs> um, but it's it was, it was really kind of a, a disaster from a streaming perspective. Because they've got this huge platform, and obviously you want people to watch it legally. Um, there were a ton of illegal streams available, but watching it legally, I mean, we were trying for most of the debate. We were watching it live on TV, but I was trying throughout the debate to try to pull up a stream, and I wasn't able to get anything. Uh, Fox did reach out to me after my story, uh, and, and they said that it was unprecedented demand, whatever that means. Um, it's still odd to me, though, because you still were, needed to have a cable subscription to watch it on their website or in their mobile app. I think the website, they might have, you know, at the end, let anybody watch it without having to log in. But at least through the mobile app, you had to have a cable login, and that app just wasn't working until about 20 minutes before the debate ended. Yeah, so... Um, and I, I tried to, to look at it as well, and I ended up just watching uh, watching it after the fact for the most part. It was an entertaining thing. But, you know, it's surprising even to this day that, that uh, organizations like that, media companies that are trying to break through into social media, trying yeah. to break through on, you know, the new world of Internet streaming, fail when they have such a huge opportunity. I mean, this is an opportunity for Fox News to really introduce itself to a younger demographic. Exactly. And they desperately need that. And no, they, they would do. have thrilled those audiences uh, that they didn't reach. And yet they failed because of some bogus technical slash whatever reason. Right. And it just is and unfortunate. I, I agree. And, and that was one of the things I argued in my piece. I said, you know, look, even putting aside the fact that the stream didn't work, what was bothersome to me was that they were going to have any sort of kind of, you know, uh, you know, a, a login wall around it at all. You know, take a lesson from the 2012 campaign. 
in that 2012 election where we saw digital really come to the forefront for the first time in, in American politics in a significant way where, you know, YouTube was was hosting debates and CNN was putting, you know, non-login um, streams and, and really making it accessible to everyone. You know, it, Facebook co-sponsored the debate. You would think that a great way to watch the debate would be on Facebook. Uh, and, and as you said, you know, this is an audience that, that Fox desperately needs if they want to be in touch with the, you know, growing number of young members of the electorate. Um, this is for the, for the candidates, frankly, you know, a, a disservice to them not to be able to reach as wide of an audience as possible. That's a great point. Facebook really should have stepped up and insisted that they use their massive server farms and incredible high bandwidth video capability to brand themselves as the deliverer of real-time video, which they're obviously trying to do. Uh, so this is a fail all around, as Donald Trump would say. They're a bunch of losers. Got some more news, really interesting news and some hilarious news coming right up. But first, I want to talk about Blue Apron, which is delicious food that's easy to make, fast to make, fun to make, and inexpensive, low-calorie. It's good in every single way you can imagine. They send you a box, and inside that box is a sort of refrigerated compartment with all kinds of really fresh, locally sourced, seasonal ingredients. And then you also get these cards that have step-by-step -step instructions that tell you exactly, no matter how inexperienced of a cook you are, exactly how to make amazing, better-than-restaurant quality meals. And I mean that. This is really delicious stuff. And if you don't believe me, and I hope you don't because... If you don't believe me, you can try it for free. You can get two meals free. There's literally no reason not to try it. Again, 500-700 calories per serving. Takes 35 minutes per meal on average to prepare these delicious meals. You got to check this out. Uh, you, 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 one of their recipes this week is summer squash and fennel salad with stuffed squash blossoms. Would you make that? Would you think to make that? <laughs> I wouldn't. With Blue Apron, they tell you exactly how to go about making amazing seasonal, regional, uh, interesting meals, always delicious. Blue Apron is a better way to cook. It's that simple. Check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's two meals free just for going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Today and for all of those delicious dinners. We will move on uh. to more technical tech news, starting with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which yesterday released version 1.0 of its privacy badger for Chrome and Firefox. I love anything with the word badger in it. So this is obviously a great product. <laughs> Noah Schwartz is a staff <laughs> technologist for the EFF and joins us now. Welcome to the show, Noah. Hello. Thank you so Thanks much for coming now. Thanks. And now, what is this privacy ba badger business and how does it work exactly? Um, so as you browse around the web, you obviously see a lot of advertisements and occasionally you see a targeted ad, an ad that seems to know something about your browsing history. Um, these targeted ads work because these ads write or read cookies or other identifying information to your browser as you browse the web. So they know who you are and they record a record of all the websites you go to. Um, so what Privacy Badger does is it tries to figure out which things are trying to track you around the web and it blocks requests and cookies from them. So um, what is new in the shipping version that was not available in the beta version of, a, of, of um, a Privacy Badger? A bunch of stuff, a lot of UI fixes. Um, Privacy Badger used to only deal with cookies. Now it deals with HTML5 local storage super cookies, as well as Canvas fingerprinting, which is uh, a query you can do to the browser to sort of figure out what size your screen is and stuff like that. Now, Noah, why should uh, the public care about this uh, dimension of privacy? I mean, what's the harm in having my personal information harvested for the purposes of contextual advertising and also for personalization? Um, I mean, the fear is that someone will know a lot about your browsing habits, and your browsing habits are very sensitive. Um, this isn't first-party tracking we're talking about. We're talking about third-party tracking. So this isn't like... When you go to Amazon.com, Amazon knows what products you look at and it can suggest products in the future. This is when you go to the NewYorkTimes.com. All these advertisers, all these social media platforms know what articles you're reading and they know things about your politics or what sensitive information to you, anything where these third parties are hosted. Um, so, I mean, this is obviously a great tool and, and it works on the desktop, but as more and more uh, browsing starts to take place on mobile, um, do you have any plans for trying to use, you know, whether it's iOS 9's, you know, content blocking stuff or some of the technologies within, you know, Chrome for Android, do you have any plans to try to develop tools that would work on mobile browsers? Um, 
So that's one of the things we're looking at. Uh, it's a lot different. Mobile browsers um, work very differently than desktop browsers. And uh, one of the things you want to fix on mobile is what apps are talking to. And a lot of the data goes through apps. So we don't have the ability to do that yet. But we're definitely looking at other desktop browsers besides Chrome and Firefox currently. Now, we covered a story earlier in the week about EF, the EF, EFF's uh, Do Not Track announcement, which is very interesting news. Now, how does this work with Do Not Track? So one of the things Privacy Badger does is it checks to see if the website conforms to this new Do Not Track agreement. And if it does, it allows the browser or allows that third party to read and write data um, about uh, Sorry, I think my computer is running out of batteries. Um, OK, so we'll let you go then. It, this, is a, this is a really interesting uh, tool. And of course, if you are interested in preventing this kind of third party tracking, then I recommend that you go to the EFF's website. That's EFF.org and check it out, download it, et cetera. Noah Schwartz is at EFF.org and on Twitter at SchwartzCR. Thank you so much for joining us today, Noah Schwartz. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Google is reducing the number of ways that advertisers can buy ads on YouTube. They're eliminating the use, for example, of advertisers' own software for buying ads, as well as Google's automated ad system DoubleClick Ad Exchange. Instead, advertisers will have to buy ads via Google's human sales team, God forbid, though uh, through DoubleClick Bid Manager or through Google AdWords. Some advertisers are disgruntled about it all because they say the change forces them to use Google's ad buying software according to an exclusive in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you know what, uh, Christina Warren, YouTube is such a great advertising medium that they'll get on board and just do what Google tells them to do because they are probably making a lot of money on these ads. Um, they are and they're not. I mean, I think that, that they get a lot of uh, probably visibility for their ads. You know, um, I'm not sure how much. I, I think the bigger issue is probably some of the video producers who continue to have problems with the fact that they've got to go through, you know, YouTube's own, Google's own salespeople or go through, you know, uh, now the... Um, the double click bid manager or AdWords to, uh, to to get advertisements. They can't actually create their own direct advertising deals, which is something that a lot of producers have really wanted. And frankly, the advertisers have wanted too. To me, that's actually been, it's interesting that they're moving away from, from the double click um, ad exchange, which I think makes sense, but rather than allowing uh, video producers, especially some of their bigger video networks to develop their own ad deals where Google could then get a cut. They're still insisting that you go through the Google sales team or go through, you know, the bid manager. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And of course the important thing is how will this affect PewDiePie? We don't know yet. <laughs> we don't know yet. So. Uh, you know what? He will still be doing exceedingly, exceedingly well. So yes, I think he'll be. He made millions and millions of dollars last year. He's doing pretty well for himself. Well, Apple today unveiled its newly redesigned website. The new site sprinkles shopping pixie dust all over the site, replacing the old shop button and separate store.apple.com subsite. Accessories are now lumped together with the products they accessorize. And why is this news? Why, would, why is a company's website redesign <laughs> newsworthy? Because Apple claims that a billion people visit apple.com each and every year. Plus, their website is very iconic. Uh, Christina yeah. Warren, they are so good at doing websites. They really um, uh, they have solid uh, for the most part, until they go down. Uh, Well-designed yeah. websites, their website, their single website now. Uh, and uh, they're just they're just brilliant at this, at uh, marketing. They, the quality of the photos of their products on the site is brilliant. They're, they're just really good at doing Apple.com. Yeah. Um, well, what's really interesting about this to me is, and, and you know, we haven't been able to get 100% verification on this, but it looks like they finally, finally, finally got rid of web objects powering the, uh, the the store. So uh, web objects was actually technology that Next created. So it goes wow. all the way that far back from, from the Next acquisition. And it's been a thing that has powered, you know, most of uh, a lot of parts of iTunes are still kind of web object based. And, and it was what powered the Apple store. And I know for a fact that you know how the Apple store would go down before new events would happen yeah. and, and, and new products would be released. That's because in order to add a new product to the Apple store, they actually had to take the entire old system down. The website had to come down just so they could add a new product to it so are you saying that if they have in fact gotten rid gotten rid of these uh, these objects that the in the future they won't go down before a new product yeah lines? i mean i mean unless they want to actually do it you know for you know i guess uh iconic reasons for people to, to to speculate yeah i mean i think that if they got rid of web objects now they would be able to actually just update their inventory system the same way they would update the the, the, the regular system they wouldn't actually have to take the whole site down first uh, which would be great yeah and we'll so we'll watch that we're gonna of course we always do the the show's live and, and do a live stream 
time and, and comment on that. And I will remember this. And if it doesn't go down before it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to credit to what you're saying here uh, with, uh, with that fact. So we'll see if that actually happens. Well, here's some really interesting news in the world of international terrorism, et cetera. Uh, it's about ISIS. Artificial intelligence is that now being applied to predict and analyze ISIS's strategy. ISIS, of course, is the uh, terrorist organization that's taking over big swaths of Iraq and Syria and doing very well for themselves despite being a bunch of uh, murderous uh, uh, mass murderers. Uh, researchers at Arizona State University entered some 2,200 ISIS events into their algorithm, and they discovered some really interesting things. And among these is that they discovered that when ISIS gets hit heavily by airborne bombing campaigns, they shift their activity away from infantry attacks and resort to the use of improvised explosive devices or IEDs. That's really interesting because then if you are, if you are uh, in the know about these attacks, these bombing raids, you can um, protect yourself better against or have, be extra vigilant about IEDs and so on. They also noticed spikes in the use of car bombs just before major inf infantry operations, which would enable... Uh, the, the coalitions united or disunited against ISIS to predict those infantry operations. And so they think the reason they do that, uh, Christina Warren, is because they want to keep the Iraqi soldiers uh, trapped inside Baghdad. So they, right. they use car bombs to sort of block the roads and stuff, and then they launch their operation. So, But it's great, yeah. great to see them applying this kind of thing uh, against the war against ISIS. No, oh, definitely. I mean, I, and I think it's really interesting just uh, the, the sort of pattern recognition stuff that they can do and, and as it's applied to military stuff. Um, I do wonder if, if if ISIS will kind of maybe catch on and try to uh, change up their their strategies a little bit. Um, and then, of course, how, how quickly um, those patterns can be redetermined. But no, I mean, I think this is great that this, this research is being done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there's another story that uh, is worth mentioning, which is that there were a, a few uh, women who were actually scamming ISIS because, of course, what ISIS does is they use social media to lure yep. people, including very young women, to come into the uh, Syria and Iraq and become these sort of like brides for, for ISIS uh, terrorists. And, uh, you know, they find they find uh, people who are vulnerable or who feel depressed or feel isolated, lonely, whatever, and they lure them in. So they're actually using that. They're allowing themselves to be lured, and then they say, but, you know, I just don't have the money to travel there. It's like the old Nigerian uh, scam <laughs> right. trick, and then they send them the money, and then they just oh, delete their yeah. Twitter account or whatever and move on. They were actually arrested for committing fraud in the country. I don't recall the country exactly, but the, but they were, they were arrested for defrauding ISIS. <laughs> So I, th I would I call on the world's <sighs> legislative bodies immediately to pass Seriously. laws saying that if you're going to scam people, it's OK to scam ISIS. Anyway, in Hack Attack News, the future and former superpowers are hacking the world's current superpower again. China linked hackers gain access to American Airlines and Sabre servers, according to Bloomberg. Sabre is a travel reservation service and the same hackers are believed to have also hit the airline company United Continental Holdings the insurance company Anthem, and also the U.S. government's personnel office. The Chinese government appears to be collecting huge amounts of information about U.S. government employees and possibly where they travel. That strategy for intelligence is called the thousand grains of sand strategy. Meanwhile, in Russia, the, Russia is the main sus suspect in the hack of an unclassified Pentagon email system used by the employees of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The government detected the intrusion on July 25th and disabled the system, and it still remains offline even today. The hack was previously reported, but the identification of the Russian government as the perp is new news. The breach was similar to the hacks of unclassified email systems of the White House and the State Department a few months ago. You know, China and Russia are really good at hacking, Christina Warren, yep. and they are going after the U.S. government in a big way. They are. And I have to wonder, you know, like, especially with the White House, who's had a really, really terrible record with their email systems. Like, honestly, you guys, you have a really big budget. How much would it cost for you to have some really, really great people come in and, and look over your systems and make sure that everything's secure or at least start auditing stuff or for the fact that you might have intruders coming in. But yeah, you're right. I mean, Russia and, and China, this is what they're good at. And, and it, it makes total sense that they're targeting the government. Yeah, it absolutely does. And I, it makes me wonder whether they uh, successfully hacked Hillary's private server. Well, who knows? Uh, in who knows? research and development, uh, Google has been granted a patent for a Google Glass screen that attaches to a hat. One way to attach is with a magnet on the underside of a baseball cap visor. People derisively called Google Glass users glass holes, and I guess people wearing this thing should be called glass hats. Do you think this is, <laughs> is this better than Google Glass, no. uh, Christina, worse, or is it the same? 
I, I don't, I can't even, I can't even like, I'm, 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 I'm like, I'm speechless. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> but yeah. I do like glass hat though. I think, I think that's good. All right. We'll I go with glass hat then. Like, All right. These glass yeah. hat, the glass hats are coming folks. Watch out. All right. We got some more news coming right up. But first let's talk about gazelle. Gazelle is, uh, used to be for several years, by far the best place to sell your used gadget. It's always a good idea. Of course, you have this device sitting around. You have some old phone. You're going to get a new phone. What do you do with the other phone? You could get a Craigslist ad or something like that, meet somebody in an alley or a parking lot somewhere and try to sell them the phone. Not a good idea, and you probably won't get that much money for it. If you go to Gazelle, they give you a lot of money for it. It's super easy and convenient. And, of course, everybody knows that Gazelle is a place to sell your gadget, but it's also a great place to buy a gadget. If you've got a budget, you can get a better device by buying a previously owned uh, certified pre-owned device from Gazelle. And one category of device is certified like new, which is just like a brand new phone. Nobody could tell, not you, not anybody else, that it's not a brand new phone right out of the box, but it will be less expensive. So you can get a better device for the same money or the same device for less money. It's all good. So buy and sell. Whenever you're going to buy and sell, time to upgrade, always think of Gazelle. Go to Gazelle first. Even if you are thinking or leaning toward a brand new device, go to Gazelle first and just see what's on offer because you may be blown away by what you can get and how much you can get it for. Find out what your iPhone's worth. Take a minute and go to gazelle.com. That's G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com and find out how much it's worth. And we thank Gazelle for their support of tech news today. In the Human Resources Department, TechCrunch's lead Apple reporter, Daryl Etherington, who's been a guest long ago on the show, he's been on recently, and The Verge's Josh Lowenson have left the world of journalism to join Apple's PR department, according to 9to5Mac. Oh. These are the latest tech journalists hired by Apple. Previously, NN Tech writers Anand Shimpy and Brian Klug, uh, Klug, Klug, I don't know how to say it, Macworld's Chris Breen and John Seth also le left journalism to join Apple. Christina Warren, journalism, especially tech journalism, is an up or out affair. You either, uh, you know, yep. as you as you rise in the ranks and become a, a columnist or whatever, uh, the number of people who can do that get fewer and fewer. And some go into journalism because they have contacts in the industry, they have knowledge of the products, et cetera. And so uh, I imagine Apple's probably pay paying them pretty well as well yeah. because, I mean, Daryl Etherington's young guy, you know. Yeah, he's young. And, and Josh, I, I've known since he was at CNET. And uh, he and I, we uh, demo 2010 baby forever. Um, we uh, we uh, became fast friends at, at that conference many years back. No, I mean, I think that this makes sense for Apple, too, to hire people who know their product, you know, who, who have been covering them from the inside out, you know, from the other side. Um, and, and frankly, it makes sense when you're dealing, I mean, it was, we know as journalists, when you're dealing with a PR person who used to be in the industry, Oftentimes you have a better rapport because you know how the other side works. So you can have a more honest conversation about things and it, and it can be less, you know, stressful than, than it is if you're, you know, just having the, the other type of a relationship. So, uh, but, but it is interesting, you know, I mean, we've seen this happen before. This has been happening for years where journalists jump from journalism to PR and, and sometimes you come back again. Um, but it is interesting. Apple historically has not been one of those companies that has uh, hired from kind of the the, the journalist uh, realms, waters. But in the post-Katie uh, Cotton era, that seems to be happening more and more. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, I, I, I personally noticed that my interactions with Apple over the last year or so have been uh, significantly um, more, they've been a more open company and and uh, I've, I've had uh, more access than I have in the past. Um, it, it will be weird though, I, I'm not gonna lie, if I, if I get a an email or, or, or a pitch or if I run into you know Josh or Daryl at an event and they're wearing an Apple logo and I'm, you know, got my press badge that's going to be uh are you I, kidding I he got weird. the job by saying i know christina warren personally <laughs> so. oh well what are you going to do you know i've known people who, you know i've known a lot of people who've gone in pr from journalism and you know one extreme is that they go into it and they're like oh my god what have i done this is horrible i hate it and other times it, it's clear that they were really meant for pr they're really good at it they enjoy it and uh, that's really where they were meant to be so i hope that uh, all these uh uh, guys will be happy at Apple. Yeah. And again, I'm sure we'll both be hearing from all of them. <laughs> Definitely. Well, big number news. I'm not sure if this is a big number or not, but it's a number. 700,000. That's how many dollars Apple spends each year on personal security. That's bodyguards and home secu security guards for CEO Tim Cook. I actually think that's kind of a low number for Same. the guy who's in charge of the world's most valuable company. Completely. I mean, honestly, I mean, I... I 
we have to think that Tim, that uh, excuse me, Donald Trump probably, you know, his <laughs> uh, security detail, I'm sure, is more expensive. And uh, I mean, let, let, let's be honest, who's more important to the future of the world? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think that that's. Uh, I, I, I I I agree with you. I think that that's uh, not a lot for you know the the world's most powerful CEO. Yeah. Absolutely not, and he doesn't make that much either, considering no. uh, his uh, stature. No, I mean that he he's he's very much one of those you know um, uh, CEOs that takes a lot of it in stock, which it, it shows great sign in, in in you know confidence in the company. And obviously, you know there will be periods of time. Balmer did this when he was a, you know CEO of Microsoft, where they'll you know sell big big stakes and and so forth. But yeah, you know he, he when it comes to he's. Tim Cook is uh, definitely not the flashy kind of uh, chief executive that you would expect for um, a company that, uh, you know, some analysts predict might reach a trillion dollars yeah. in the next uh, market cap in the next decade. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're going to love this one, Christina. In news you can lose, a UK band called Delta Heavy has resurrected Clippy as yes. the main character in their new music video for a song I called Ghost. It. Clippy oh. was Microsoft's abused and maligned assistant for Microsoft Office back in the day. Hold on to your butts, people. Here comes the video. <laughs> so they showed Clippy on this old and busted yeah. computer and announced this 20 years later. That looks like Doom. Yeah. yeah we're trapped in a Doom uh, chamber. <laughs> That's the hidden Easter egg in Word? Okay. A little correction there from Jason Matthews. That is much more fair. So now Clippy has, has hanged himself from a, from a, a bunch of icons. But he's still alive and he sli slips out of the noose. And now he's walking up behind Nelson Mandela. Um, and, and there's a Twitter bird. There's a Twitter bird barfing up a bunch of content. Uh, there's a series sort of thing. Autonomy. Yeah. Yeah, this video makes no sense at all. No, but this is so peak 90s on so many levels, the animation style. Yeah. Oh, and they've got the Microsoft Fish from um, the um, animated oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, from the Windows 95 aquarium screen saver. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, and we've got the pipe screen saver, too. Oh, my God. This is so peak Microsoft. This is fantastic. Uh, I wonder if Microsoft Bob makes a cameo. God, that would be amazing. You could be happy in Bob's house. <laughs> now he's in a um, smiley. Oh, here comes solitaire cards, like... Attacking yep. Clippy. Oh, we've got all of our, uh, our early emojis, smiley face emoticons. Oh my God! And we've got a Windows uh, <laughs> music player, the the uh, the cubes. This is seriously, yeah. this is some hardcore. This is like all the Microsoft screensavers like ever. It's like Windows 95 yeah. and Windows XP like on crack. This is amazing. This is a UK band. Yeah. I want whatever these people are yeah. smoking. This is awesome. Oh my God, now we've got like Candy Crush Madness and memes and cats. Like we're literally going through watching this watching this video. We are literally going through the last 20 years of <laughs> like web culture. And I'm not gonna lie, Mike Elgin, I think this is fantastic. This is fantastic. Now that Snapchat, I mean, like literally we're going from like Clippy to, oh, and I love that they've got the, the Mac trash icon. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Poor Clip. Oh, he's inside the trash can now. <laughs> he's, but he's inside a Mac trash can with Jeeves. With Jeeves. Oh my God. Jeeves is, is dead. Jeeves is dead. Jeeves is like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I always wondered what it looked like inside the trash can. Yes, yeah, seriously. This is. Oh, we've got the emoji. Poop emojis. Poop emojis. Coming. Lots of. Uh, There's pointers. a poop emoji. Yep. Oh, we've got all sorts of classic smartphones and tablets. This is the greatest so thing weird. ever. Oh. Yes. Oh, we've got a. Uh, oh, we've got um, classic YouTube videos. Charlie with my finger. Uh, Susan, what's her face from um, uh, Britain's Got Talent? Yeah. Oh, there's the uh, chocolate rain yeah. guy. The chocolate talking rain. orange. We've got, yeah, yeah, annoying orange. We've got. Uh, Please let that intruder be there. This is great. Um, Nelson Mandela so is a headbanger. Yep. Oh my God. Oh, God. <laughs> One Clippy's direction. everywhere. Oh, God. In a perfect world, Clippy would be everywhere. He would be everywhere. 
Um, I have to say, when they did the April Fool's joke last year where they brought Clippy back to Word.com, to for Office.com, the Office 365, the online version of Word, that was maybe the greatest thing in the entire world. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Wow. That was incredible. Wow. Wow. Delta Heavy. That's yes. what's... Wow. Incredible. We got to have those guys on the show or on some yeah. show or whatever. No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like... Wow. <laughs> Getting verklempt. All right. I am. Well. I'm like... <laughs> I can't. I can't, Mike. I can't. Well done. Well done. Uh, heavy, whatever your name is. Delta Heavy. Delta Heavy. Yeah, exactly. News you can use. News you can abuse. Our TNT fan of the day is Daniel Kemble in Portland, Oregon, who posted this picture on Twitter. He watches Tech News Today through Stitcher on his 8-inch nice. Android tablet. And uh, there's a big American flag in the window for some reason. Nice. Very, very cool. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. And use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Christina Warren, what are you doing these days? What's going on? Uh, well, I'm kind of working on a couple of stories. I've been working on a project for the last couple of weeks, kind of diving into Apple Watch development and talking to developers and seeing kind of what the real story is with how they're approaching the Apple Watch. So I've got my first part of that story is going to be coming out today. Um, I'm also going to be writing something, working with a, one of our political reporters about uh, Carly Fiorina's pub <laughs> take on tech policy and the fact that she thinks that the tech companies should give up. Um, access to um, the government, which uh, kind of doesn't really jive with what you would think a former tech executive would say. So um, it, it just working on some of those things. And then uh, we uh, we recently got the Amazon Dash buttons in the office and uh, <laughs> uh, our review of that went up today. But um, I'm going to be writing a rebuttal because Ray, uh, Raymond Wong, who we love, but Ray Ray was kind of down on the Dash buttons. And I think they're genius. I think they're brilliant. And so uh, I'm writing a little rebuttal argument to his, this is only for lazy people argument because my argument is yes it's for lazy people but it doesn't matter it's still great yeah i want to i want to you know i want it for everything charge my te tesla button and have the, the thing yes come in, like, I, I, the I genuinely no I, I i'm kind of a big fan of the dash button yeah, yeah, yeah. i thought it was a joke at first i really did and then once we got them and we were actually like playing with them i'm thinking you know what this is kind of th there's something here i can see apple there's combining something. the redesign concepts and its website yes. with the dash button and just having a buy another iPhone button on the iPhone. So we'll see if that actually I have a helps. gesture, kind of like the Moto X where you can just tap twice, maybe on the phone and order something. Yeah. Uh, so I wish there was like a button to push. I, you know, read Christina Warren's latest screed button. Yes. You know, that'd be <laughs> great. All right, Christina. Well, thank you so much for everything. And we will see you back here next week. And good luck. We'll find uh, Christina on Twitter at film underscore girl. Thanks again, Christina. We'll see you next week. See you next week, Mike. Right, bye bye. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on Stitcher, just like our TNT fan of the day today. You can also choose another way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. You can watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1700 UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can also follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Tech News Today TV. Follow me at elgin.com. Don't miss our other new show, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. Today's guest is Lauren Hawkinson, who is a writer at The Next Web and a frequent guest on Tech News Today as well. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. The show is produced by Jason Clanthes and edited by Tony Wang. My name's Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you Monday.